Hi, everyone. So I guess when uh, I paused it last time, the audio didn't come back up. So thanks for Julia for letting me know. And I know some of you emailed me, but I didn't have access to uh, take care of this over the long weekend. So I'm extending the due date for the homework. And here is the hopefully new and improved video. And it's the fifth video of the unit and it's on the peacetime agenda after the war. So uh, we have here, one of the first issues is demobilizing the army, right? You have all these soldiers who fought in the war. Now that um, Cornwallis surrenders at Yorktown, what happens next? Well, many troops weren't going home until Congress redressed their grievances. Um, a lot of it was on issues of not getting paid. So as a protest, many met at Independence Hall in June of 1783, about 400. And then within a few days, about another 100 came from the Lancaster area. And what this became known as was the Pennsylvania Mutiny of 1783. So they were protesting. And in fact, Congress had to vacate Philadelphia because uh, they feared their safety and they had to leave Independence Hall. And so this isn't a good sign, right? Washington sent about 1,500 soldiers under General Heath and Howe Command, who actually already were in retirement. They had to come back out already. Um, so Washington wasn't really going there himself, but he sent word like, hey, come on, we're soldiers. What did you fight for if you're going to destroy your government already? Um, so as a result... Oh, my is your room. Yes. They were given three months' pay. And what this did was this questioned a lot of the authority of the new Congress. Since they, um, they, when they vacated, they went to Princeton, a little FYI there. Okay, and, uh, another issue is opening of the West. So two ordinances, uh -huh, the past were 1785 and 1787. And this becomes known as the Northwest Ordinance. So I believe we did that in class at the end of last week. We'll be touching about that today when we meet. I guess that will be in the past by the time you see this. Uh, but it wasn't easy, right? Now that we acquired this land, what do we do with it? How does it become a state? Um, what laws should go to this area? Um, coincidentally, they needed to have the laws that already existed in uh, other states. But they had all these things now that they had to try to figure out. Um, so they tried to promote settlement expansion uh, via land laws and new Indian policies. So the Indian policies become an issue as well. Um, so this is really important when you think of things for the nature's future. How are you going to deal with um, politics? How are you going to deal with um, the natives? Um, they also had problems that they, Congress couldn't get British troops out of the western ports, nor guarantee free navigation of the Mississippi. Um, Congress operated as if the Native Americans of this area were conquered peoples. That's it, some issues. Um, so during the mid-1780s, Congress imposed several land treaties on those tribes, mostly of uh, the Iroquois. At the Treaty of Fort Stanwix in 1784, the Six Nations of the Iroquois officially made peace, ceded most of their lands to the U.S., and retreated to small uh, reservations. But then by the 1790s, little remained of the Iroquois' domain, but a few little areas um, in the white settlement. Um, and eventually these treaties generated widespread Indian resentment, and we'll see how that plays a role later. Uh, we also have um, issues of, do these states, are they gonna become slave states? Or are they gonna become free states? It's not an issue right away, but it becomes an issue in the decades um, that follow. Because as you see by the, the map there, and by the work we did in class, it took a long time before they actually did become states, right? Um, Congress also failed to resolve problems with the European nations that still laid claims to some of this area west of the Appalachian Mountains. In June of 1784, Spain, that still um, possessed Florida at the time, and the Gulf Coast, and part of the Mississippi West, closed the mouth of the Mississippi to American shipping. So now this becomes not just a political issue, but an economic issue as well. And for a young country that needed money, that was really serious. Because you see why here, um, the nation was at extensive debt. The nation's war debt was estimated to be around $35 million, and much of that was held by both French and Dutch bakers. They couldn't really make 
regular payments against the principal of the loan. So Congress actually had to borrow additional money just to pay the interest on the loan. Um, so they're just constantly borrowing and borrowing. So by 1781, Congress appointed Robert Morris of Philadelphia. He was a wealthy merchant originally from Liverpool. His role was as the superintendent of finance. I think I spoke a little bit about him last class as being like the financier of the revolution. I think we did his quote about taxes. So he was given broad authority to deal with the nation's of financial affairs. So he urged that states stop issuing paper money and he persuaded Congress to demand that states pay um, certain um, money to Congress. He persuaded Congress to charter their Bank of North America, and he made, took steps to make federal bonds more attractive to investors, just trying to get money somehow. He made good progress, but things were still pretty wishy-washy for the nation's finances. Congress, remember under the Articles of the Confederation, this is important, lacked the authority to tax. And so they had to depend on states' willingness just to give money to meet their financial obligations. As you can imagine, that that wasn't really workable. So Congress in October of 1781 requested $8 million from the states. And this opens up a whole new can of worms. Two and a half years later, only one and a half million dollars came in from that. Then by 1784, Morris resigns. By 1786, look at this, the federal revenue totaled $370,000 a year. That's it. Um, and it wasn't enough to even do just the bare maintenance of running the federal government. Not all Americans were too worried about this. Um, they just sort of relied on their state governments to do what they had to do. Um, others saw it that, hey, this is another example that Congress is weak. And how long could a country even endure with situations like this? Um, and this is another call um, as we start to see for the Constitutional Convention. We have these issues with the West. We have these issues with um, other countries. We have these issues that we can't tax and we have financial situations. Um, something, Congress doesn't look strong here. And what can we do to make the federal government stronger if that's what the nation needs for survival? And that's what we're gonna get to um, for the rest of this week.